on today's show. I don't discount the possibility that there could be a terrible uptick in terms of violence, um, especially given the rhetoric. I mean, I watched in Yugoslavia uh, Slobodan Milosevic for four years used the language of violence, and at a certain point, people actually began to carry out acts of gratuitous violence. Uh, and I think we're, we're certainly flirting with that. Chris Hedges is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author, and he joins us today as part of our ongoing series of conversations concerning what it means to be living during the time of the coronavirus. That's next on Letters and Politics. First, the news. For Pacifica Radio, I'm Eileen Alfandari. A new model developed by Columbia University researchers says if the U.S. had begun to lock down and impose physical distancing two weeks earlier, 83% of the deaths the country has suffered would have been avoided. More than 93,000 people in this country have died from COVID-19 so far, and one and a half million have been infected, according to statistics compiled by Johns Hopkins University. A lockdown a week earlier would have saved the lives of about 36,000 people, according to the model. The Columbia University modeling has implications for a potential resurgence of the virus in the fall and winter. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Director Dr. Robert Robert Redfield, who has granted few interviews since the pandemic gained ground, broke his silence with a new warning of such a resurgence. In an interview with the Financial Times, Redfield says the rapid spread of coronavirus in the Southern Hemisphere suggests it's likely to flare up again in the U.S. this fall and winter. Redfield warns the U.S. will have to increase its disease tracking capabilities rapidly in the next few months to avoid another public health crisis as seasonal flu coincides with a second wave of COVID-19. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Anthony Fauci says now's not the time to let up on efforts to stop the spread of the coronavirus in this country. The scientific evidence clearly indicates that physical separation has, 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 has worked, but not completely. If you look at the curves in our country, it isn't like everything is dramatically going down. Now is not the time to tempt fate and pull back completely. There is, there is a golden mean there. Fauci's interview came with Julia Roberts and was online. He has disappeared from television, not conducting an interview there since May 4th. When Fauci appeared via video as a witness for a Senate hearing May 13th, he was rebuked the next day by President Trump, who said Fauci was trying to play all sides of the equation. The number of Americans thrown out of work since the coronavirus crisis struck two months ago has climbed to nearly 39 million. More than 2.4 million people applied for unemployment benefits last week. A new survey shows more than half of U.S. residents making $75,000 a year or less have experienced a loss of income in the past two months. More than 10% of households said they couldn't get enough of the food they needed. Almost 25% said they had trouble paying their rent or mortgage. The survey was released by the U.S. Census Bureau and five other federal agencies. The African continent needs to test about 10 times the number of people it has already tested for the coronavirus. That's according to the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Its director, John N. Kengasong, says South Africa should strive to test at least 1% of the population of 1.3 billion people or 13 million people. Africa's number of reported virus cases is above 95,000 and could surpass 100,000 by the weekend. And Kengasong says South Africa Africa has by far the highest number of COVID-19 cases on the continent. That's South Africa. Countries with the highest cumulative number of cases are South Africa with 18,000 uh, cases. Egypt 
with 14,229 cases. And Kengasan said countries with fragile health systems and a recent history of conflict like Somalia and South Sudan remain very concerning as cases rise there quickly. Wide areas of the coastline of India and Bangladesh were flooded and millions of people remained without power after the most powerful cyclone to hit the region in more than a decade left dozens dead and a trail of destruction. Large portions of the city of Kolkata and its suburbs were underwater. The ongoing coronavirus pandemic made mass evacuations ahead of the storm difficult. Shelters were unable to run at full capacity in many places. Some people were too scared of the risk of infection to gather there. The former chief of India's weather agency has said the intensity of regularly occurring cyclones has increased due to hotter ocean temperatures caused by global warming. Floodwaters surging through central Michigan were mixing with containment ponds at a Dow chemical plant and could displace sediment from a downstream Superfund site. Dow claimed there was no risk to people or the environment. That claim came despite the fact that the toxic Superfund cleanup site is contaminated by dioxin, a highly carcinogenic substance which also causes reproductive and developmental harm. Meanwhile, the Titabawasi River crested at just over 35 feet in the city of Midland. Floodwaters caused two dams to breach and forced the evacuation of about 10,000 people. The danger isn't over yet. Brad Kay is the Midland city manager. We have gone in this city through many large storms. We've had many floods uh, that have impacted our residents, the properties within the city, and certainly the services that we can provide during these flood events. Um, We have never been through an event such as we're experiencing today um, and over the last few days, and we'll continue to experience over the next few days. The Environmental Protection Agency warned in 2016 that climate change caused by global warming was likely to increase the frequency of intense springtime rainfall in Michigan and flooding, meaning this week's so-called 500-year flood is likely to recur much sooner than that. President Trump visits Michigan today, a state where he has battled with Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer, at times calling her that woman. Trump is on his way to Ypsilanti outside Detroit to tour a fo- Ford Motor Company factory that has been repurposed to manufacture ventilators. The White House is refusing to say whether he'll follow the Ford Motor Company policy and Michigan state law that he wear a mask while touring the facility. His arrival comes a day after Trump threatened to withhold federal funds from Michigan over the state's expanded vote-by-mail efforts. I'm Eileen Alfandiri for Pacifica Radio. Chris Hedges joins us via Skype for our ongoing series of conversations about what it means to be living during the time of the coronavirus and what it means for our future. Chris Hedges is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. He has covered wars firsthand on several continents. And he's the author of many books. His latest is called America, the Farewell Tour. Chris Hedges, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you back to this radio program, and I do thank you for taking time to talk to us today. Thank you, Mitch. Yeah. I'd like to begin these discussions by just asking you, and go wherever you want to go with this, but it seems to me this is a contemplative kind of a time that we're all living through. What are you paying attention to? What what are you thinking about? Well, it's it's exposed the internal rot and dysfunction of the American system, uh, our infrastructure, whether that's medical, uh, whether that's, um, uh, you know, in terms of our ability to provide uh, uh, support for people who don't have employment, uh, whether that is uh, the physical infrastructure itself, uh, all of it has been assaulted over the last few decades. Uh, and and the stress of the pandemic uh, has exposed the weakness of the system itself. Um, our response to the pandemic has been um, haphazard, uh, has lacked any kind of uh, unified direction, uh, has exposed tremendous deficiencies within our healthcare system. Uh, we don't have appropriate stockpiles because in, in a for-profit healthcare system, you don't make money by making stockpiles. Uh, we have huge segments of the American public that are outside the healthcare system. 
Uh, we have 50 million Americans who get their health care through employee sponsored health care. Now they're out of a job. Now they don't have health care. Um, I mean, it's just been a catastrophic response uh, with needless suffering and needless death. Uh, but that is because the system itself is so decayed. And this has exposed in a very uh, frightening way how deep that decay is. A few things there I want to unpack with you because I've, I've, I've been thinking about a couple of them as well. The first one being, as I, I tend to see this as well as something that would happen after, what, four-decade attempt of chipping away at what the state does or what the government does with either cutting the role that government does, these private uh, public partnerships, outsourcing what the government does, and then suddenly here we are in this moment when the free market's not actually working and all we have is government but i'm exaggerating a little bit obviously but and then all of a sudden here we are here we all we have is is a government that that has been weakened over time right well you know the free market uh you know, the capitalist class does what it's designed to do, which is uh, uh, maximize profit and reduce the cost of labor, uh, whether through automation or breaking labor unions, uh, reducing people to uh, temp work in the gig economy. That's that's what it's designed to do. It's not designed to uh, to run a government. Uh, to force an entire country to kneel before the dictates of the marketplace. But in our corporate coup d'etat, uh, which the slow motion coup d'etat, John Ralston Saul calls it, uh, we have essentially reconfigured American society to exclusively serve the interests of the markets. You saw that with the so-called stimulus package, uh, two-thirds of which went directly to uh, large industries, the airline industry, the hospitality industry, uh, the banking industry. Uh, there was a symbolic uh, gesture towards a suffering working class in the form of checks of $1,200. The whole effort on the part of uh, the huge numbers of unemployed to get unemployment insurance has been disastrous because and number one, it's an antiquated system. And number two, uh, it, it, uh, it doesn't have the capacity to deal with the volume. Um, so, And then what happens after four months? Uh, by this summer, where you have even Mnuchin, uh, the foreclosure king, uh, talking about 25% unemployment. Um, the inability on small businesses to... Uh, to get loans, uh, and we're watching even large businesses uh, now, Neiman Marcus, uh, Gold's Gym, are filing for bankruptcy. So um, it, on every single level, the, the system, uh, because it is not designed to serve the common good, to serve the public, but to serve this cabal of uh, corporate oligarchs uh, who have no loyalty to the country, and companies like Amazon, don't even pay income taxes. Um, and, uh, and and so at a moment when uh, that infrastructure and coordination and, uh, uh, you know, vision is so desperately needed, we don't have it. And of course, it's compounded by, by Trump in the White House. So uh, you mentioned the last book I wrote, America, The Farewell Tour, which is about the breakdown of social bonds that uh, have destroyed whole communities, particularly working class communities, and the attendant problems that that brings, the opioid crisis, uh, uh, all sorts of gambling, alcohol addictions, hate crimes, uh, sexual sadism, uh, it's, it's all there. And uh, I think the pandemic is, has kind of ripped back the veil uh, to uh, expose in a very disturbing way how decrepit the American system is, uh, one that is highly militarized, both externally and internally, uh, but 
uh, where very little else functions. A few weeks ago, you did an interview with Salon that went viral, and at least in my feed. I, I kept seeing it reappear, and which and it quoted you on, on, on the front of the, the website, so that's exactly what it said in the feed, uh, that what we're, and this was a few weeks ago, but that the days that we're going through right at this very moment, that we'll consider these something to a kind of being the good days. What did sure. you, what did you yeah, mean by that? Because it hasn't hit yet. So uh, you have already de facto rent strikes, which are de facto rent strikes because they don't have the money, even if they wanted to, to pay their landlords. What happens when the credit card companies can't get paid, the student loans can't? get paid, household debt can't get paid, car loans can't get paid. All of these things have been bundled up uh, as subprime mortgages were. It's just now more expansive in terms of a financial gimmick. Um, uh, and, 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 And the inability to respond to the pandemic, uh, the opening up of segments of the economy when there isn't adequate testing, uh, will, of course, just lead to uh, cluster after cluster, wave after wave of this virus, uh, which will mean that we'll be dealing this uh, for months, if not longer. Uh, and it, it's uh, uh, there's going to be we're already seeing massive, uh, f- you know, bread lines uh, food at food pantries, at food distribution centers. Um, you know, and this is the start, I think, of something that is unprecedented in most of our lifetimes, uh, something that will rival uh, and in many ways surpass the suffering of the Great Depression. And that, of course, will have political ramifications, um, which we're seeing glimpses of with these armed uh, astroturf to right wing militia types appearing with AR-14s and Kalashnikovs on the steps of uh, state capitals demanding that the country reopen. I, uh, I, I, I can't see how this is going anywhere good. Doesn't it almost feel like the, re- the emergence of the Tea Party again, but this time with guns? Yeah, I mean, the... the uh, what happens in times, I saw this in Yugoslavia, of uh, economic distress and governmental dysfunction, and this is certainly true in Yugoslavia, is that you give, uh, you, you see these demagogues, Franjo Tuzman, Slobodan Milosevic, Radovan Karadzic, Trump-like figures, buffoonish, by the way, like Trump in many ways, certainly with Karadzic and Tuzman, um, and uh, and this uh, vitriolic rhetoric of violence, uh, in the incitement to violence against demonized minorities who are blamed for the crisis. Uh, and with a segment of any population that works, it worked in Yugoslavia, it worked in Weimar with the economic collapse of Weimar after the 1929 crash. Uh, and it, it, it will work here. And we are a country uh, where uh, violence is encoded within our DNA. We have school shootings and mall shootings. And, I mean, mass shootings are an epidemic. Uh, And so the uh, expression of rage and frustration within American society has, from its inception, uh, been expressed violently towards the other. Um, And uh, uh, Trump, the more cornered he becomes, uh, the more of an enabler of that violence he will be. Uh, And so... Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, history, Mark Twain said history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Um, I certainly see many similarities to the breakdown of Yugoslavia, uh, which, of course, led to a horrific ethnic cleansing and, and finally war. I find that comparison interesting, especially when you said a little earlier about having a 
kind of caricature figure as a leader is actually not so unusual, even though sometimes we may view having President Donald Trump as this odd and unusual event. Well, that's how the Nazis were viewed by the German industrialists. But the, the industrial class, along with the liberal class, we must never forget, when it feels threatened, uh, and in the, the difference with Weimar is that you had a powerful communist party, will always side with the fascists. So, for instance, in the, la- in the recent primaries, uh, we had a series of articles uh, in the New York Times where the donor class of the New York Times made it very clear that if Bernie Sanders was the nominee, they were going to vote for Trump. Uh, this whole idea of the least worst, which they, that only applies to me and you, uh, it doesn't apply to them. Uh, and uh, they would prefer Biden in the same way that they preferred Clinton. Uh, it's a much more acceptable face of empire. Trump is an embarrassment to empire. Uh, but they know that both Biden or Trump will protect their economic hegemony and political power, uh, will do nothing to disrupt it. Uh, and should there have been an effective insurgency within the Democratic Party uh, that that didn't uh, give uh, to the Democratic voters an anointed corporate candidate like Biden, they were very clear that they were going to Trump. And of course, Trump has a lot more money than Biden. So, and Biden is an extremely weak candidate. Um, you know, is he really the best that the Democratic Party can provide after four years? Uh, so. Uh, yeah, our, 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 our system is uh, anemic, uh, not just our economic system, but our political system. And the consequences of that will be played out in the next few months uh, in ways that um, as this crisis uh, begins to uh, really exact a toll within the society, not only in terms of sickness and in death, but in terms of an economic toll, uh, will manifest itself in all sorts of political distortions. Interesting to see how over the years, especially recent years, how elections have come to dominate our media landscape and, and the coverage that we do to where presidential election season seems to go on for two years now. And as soon as that's over, you're right back into the, the midterm election season. But here we are in this moment, probably due to the coronavirus, it almost seems like, and, and now we're just months away from an actual presidential election, and it almost feels like the election has been put on a back burner. Yeah, I mean, the elections are are spectacles. You're right, they are, go on, they're interminable. Um, they are covered as if they are a sporting event. I mean, right down to the configuration of... Uh, election sets, which look like something off Sunday afternoon football. I don't know when football is, I'll watch it. But, you know, you, so you have the announcer and you have two people from one team and two people from another team and, uh, you know, all the scoreboard behind them. Uh, it's issue less. Uh, it masks the fact that um, there is no significant difference on all the major issues between the Republican and Democratic parties, whether that's imperialism, whether that's quote unquote free trade, uh, whether that's the security and surveillance state, mass incarceration, the militarization of police, what Biden, by the way, was an architect of all of that during the Clinton administration. So, yeah, it's of course, the spectacle has been put on hold. Uh, It's very hard to do that virtually uh, if you're Joe Biden from your basement. But again, I, and, uh, you know, Benjamin DeMott, there have been some good people who've written about it. It's, it's just a political version of reality television, which is how we ended up with a figure like Trump, whose fictional persona was created uh, on The Apprentice. Uh, you know, and then even the language the media use, you know, who gets knocked out first, who makes it into the semifinals and the finals, who's you know, got the most money, who's the most devious, who's the most cunning, who's going to come out on top, uh, who's, you know, who, which uh, political figure or manufactured personality appeals to us most. It, it's, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's it's bread in circus. Um, and, of course, that is, again, symptomatic of a, of a, uh, of a society in, in deep distress and a democracy that no longer functions. 
Chris Hedges, in this time, do you, and I know you're always somewhat circumspect about when people talk about hope, but do you hold, that said, do, do you hold out any hope that what we're experiencing right now could be a big enough shock to the system? Do you see this as being a moment that can transition into something better? Yes, um, but not through the political process. That's going to come by pitting power against power, which means, um, you know, Amazon workers going on strike. I think we're talking about frontline workers, uh, medical staff who are not receiving proper protection uh, going on strike, um, uh, food service workers, um, uh, those people who are, you know, oh, the hedge fund managers who have orchestrated the largest transference of wealth. Uh, upwards in American history, where are they? Uh, our great, uh, you know, business, they call themselves leaders. Well, they're all off in uh, their gated compounds or private islands or yachts. Uh, and the people who actually hold the country together uh, are suffering not only uh, wage suppression uh, and, uh, as with Amazon, a very active uh, campaign to deny them the right to unionize and protect themselves. So, I, I, you know, there is a, only so much the working class can take, which, as Barbara Ehrenreich correctly points out, being part of the working poor in this country is one long emergency. You're working 70 hours a week, probably two or three jobs. Uh, so, yes, I, I think that, but it won't come by this, uh, the debate among the courtiers about Biden and Trump. Uh, or the poll numbers that will come out of the street. And we've seen signs of that. Um, however, I, I think we also have to acknowledge that the state has amassed uh, both legally and physically uh, systems of internal repression, unlike anything we've ever seen in human history, not only in terms of wholesale surveillance, but, and we look at the communities where uh, these deindustrialized pockets where mostly where more mostly poor people of color live to see the reign of terror and terror is the right word uh, 1900 i think americans are shot every year almost all of them unarmed by the police uh the denial of habeas corpus the denial of due process a court system that doesn't really exist it's about coercing people through pleas uh prison population that's 25 percent of the world's Prison population were 5% of the world's population. Again, going back to Biden, it was this whole effort under the Clinton administration to triple and quadruple sentences, the so-called three strikes you're out law. Um, and what is done to the vulnerable is a window into what the state uh, under uh, pressure will do to the rest of us. And they have both the physical and legal mechanisms to do it. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, I'm cautiously hopeful uh, that uh, there will be a kind of consciousness, especially on the part of the working class that is was already suffering tremendously before this pandemic uh, and is now literally been being ordered into workplaces at the risk of their lives. Um, and yet at the same time, I have no doubt that that the state will respond ruthlessly and viciously. If there is a real effort to try and, and we saw it with with Bernie. I mean, Bernie's in the, on the landscape of politics is hardly a political radical. He's a he's a New Deal Democrat, uh, and they couldn't take that. Uh, they uh, were already red baiting him and uh, organizing to make sure he didn't get the nomination. Um, but should there be, and he was attempting to do that uh, by the rules within the Democratic Party. Should there be? And I hope there is, but should there be real unrest on the streets with any kind of popular pressure, um, they they will not hesitate to call out the goons. Uh, and we've seen them uh, in the WTO demonstrations and everywhere else. We are in conversation with Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author Chris Hedges. And this is part of our ongoing series of conversations on what it means to be in this moment of the coronavirus and what it means for our future. We bring this series to you during a spring 2020 fun drive. Now, fun drives are the lifeblood of public broadcasting of this radio station and certainly of this radio program. 
public broadcasting at its very best strives to inform people to be to bring different perspectives to the air to try to foster understanding between people and these are the goals that public broadcasting sets out to try to achieve now sometimes we achieve these goals and sometimes we don't but those are the goals that we set out every day to do on this radio program and also uh, everyone tries to do at this radio station the only way to have this be our sole objective to, to serve a public good i would argue is through a public model hence public broadcasting because if this was through the private model or as yesterday vj prashad would call through a profit model then we are running to the lowest common denominator in order to make that profit. But the truth is, we're not selling you anything. Instead, I am asking you for your support according to what you can donate to this radio station right now. So I'm asking you to go to your phones or you can do it online as well and give us a call. If you're listening to KPFA, in Northern California, the phone number is 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. And online at kpfa.org. I am desperate to get our listeners who have not donated yet and who usually don't donate to donate today because the only way that we are going to make it in this fund drive and we are a fund drive to fund drive we have a fund drive to fund drive kind of existence it's very much akin to a paycheck to paycheck kind of existence and one what one, one terrible fund drive could potentially put us under uh during a very tenuous time as you know i, I know you know that um and I am desperate to get folks who have not pledged before because if we don't get them, I I don't think this time we'll be able to make it. This is our our situation. And these are the kind of listeners, I'm going to sort of group them, but you have to be careful because no one ever fits perfectly in any kind of categorization. But just to try to illustrate how, how things work with public broadcasting and how things work during these fund drives. I'm going to say, and this is oversimplifying things, we, we have sort of three different categories, three different groups of listeners. The first one are people who pledge every time we ask them to do. So they do it. They're like, yeah, here, here you go. Whatever I can do, whatever I can do, here, here it is. You, 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 you guys are in a fun drive, here you go. These people donate sometimes multiple times in a single fund drive, never mind donating multiple times in a year. I wouldn't be here without those people. That's just the facts. This program wouldn't exist without those people. This radio station, frankly, would not exist without those radio sta- without those uh, without those people. I like to call them givers because every time they every time we ask, they give. That's what they do. That's how they function in society. We all know people like that. We all cherish people like that. I know many of us don't know how they do it either, but they're there. And we're here because of them. And then we have donors who, who give maybe once a year. And that's basically what we ask for, right? A subscription, a subscription to this radio station. Uh, it's what you do with Netflix. It's what you do with Hulu. It's what you do with Amazon Prime. The difference here is you're not buying it, you're supporting it because you can get this whether you donate or not. And so can everyone else, recognizing, of course, not everyone is in position right now to donate. But regardless, you know, you can't do that with Netflix. You can't do that with Hulu. Can't do that with Amazon Prime. You can't pay, you're cut off. Here, no, that's not how public broadcasting works. Right? We see it as part of a common good available for everyone whenever they need it. And we have 
a large group of folks who donate once a year. And that's basically what we ask. That That's what we need. And again, we're not here without them. The show's not here without them, including people who give maybe not once a year, but maybe once every two years, occasionally like that. Same thing. Same thing. We rely on these people too, or we're not here. Then there's a third group of listeners. And frankly, this is our largest group of listeners that we have. And this is the struggle of public broadcasting in order to be able to continue that actually just don't donate. I'm not trying to shame anyone here because I get it. I I access a lot of different public uh, media, uh, you know, forums, and I, I, I don't pledge to every single one of them. Of course not. Who can't, right? But that said, that that's our largest group of people. And in this time of the coronavirus, when we are hampered in how we can even do one of these fund drives, but yet still have the responsibility of having these fund drives because it's the lifeblood of public broadcasting, um, we've already had the givers give. Like we had a very strong first week. I don't want to overstate it, but we met our goals each day, not by over a whole lot, but we did. We met our goals each day because those were the givers who give every time we ask them to give. But they have given now. And now things have, this week, pretty much slowed down significantly for us. And we anticipated this happening, and that's okay. But basically, the only way we're going to make it now is, especially this during this time of crisis, is that if we're going to have people who usually don't give, give this time. And support your local public broadcaster. I need you. I'm desperate for you to support us today so that we can keep this radio station on the air in these critical months ahead. So for KPFA in Northern California, that phone number is 1-800-439-5732. one 800 Four three nine five seven three two, and online at kpfa.org. And in Southern California to KPFK, that number is 818-985-5735. 818-985-5735. Online at KPFK. Dot O-R-G. And I do thank you, and we do return to our conversation with Chris Hedges. I, I kind of framed in a question to you the armed protesters wanting, you know, the, the, the economy and, and the states to open themselves back up as kind of the Tea Party 2.0, I guess. I didn't say it then, but I'll say it now. Do, do you potentially see, I mean, it sounds like maybe we could see a potential Occupy Wall Street 2.0. Yeah, um, but at the same time, the you know these right wing groups um, and they have uh, risen since the Obama presidency, uh, uh, the two percenters and the Proud Boys and Knights of the All Right. Uh, uh, I mean, some of these groups, like the two percenters, are primarily veterans, um, uh, coupled with these mercenary. Forces, uh, Eric Prince, there was an article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago about how he was using these for-profit mercenaries to infiltrate, of all things, teachers' unions. Um, they, will, they will use and empower that base. And again, that has a long continuity in American history, going all the way back to the American Legion, which was really formed to, uh, by right-wing veterans to attack the Wobblies and the communists and everyone else. So um, I, I don't... I don't discount the possibility that there could be a terrible uptick in terms of violence, um, especially given the rhetoric. I mean, I watched in Yugoslavia, uh, Slobodan Milosevic for four years use the language of violence. And at a certain point, people actually began to carry out acts of gratuitous violence. Uh, and I think we're, we're certainly flirting with that, uh, especially with a disenfranchised white working class. Uh, the rise of neo-Confederate movements in the South, I, a couple of years ago, walked through Montgomery with the great civil rights attorney, Brian Stevenson, 
And he was pointing out all the Confederate memorials in the city. Montgomery, of course, 50 percent of the residents of Montgomery are black. And and Brian said, well, these most of these went up in the last 10 years. And I said, that's exactly what happened in Yugoslavia, uh, that with a disenfranchised working class, you know, in this case, it was Serb or Croat. They reached back into a mythical past. Uh, and at that point, you can't communicate because. Uh, people are not speaking out of verifiable fact, uh, which I think is part of the reason Brian has started his whole lynching project to cement verifiable fact in in uh, Georgia and other states. Uh, and that severance from a reality based universe, we haven't spoken about the Christian right, but this Christian right is filling very quickly Trump's ideological void. That's Pence and Betsy DeVos and uh, Ben Carson and Mike Pompeo and Barr, they all come out of this. Uh, And that's why he has 81% of the evangelical vote. Uh, And I, a seminary graduate, um, but I look at them as a fascistic force that infuse the iconography and language of uh, Christianity with the iconography and language of the state. Um, they are Christian heretics, and part of the failure on the part of the liberal church, which I come out of, is is to name them for who they are. Um, and these people, are, you know, they're the ones who are sending the death threats into Fauci because they don't believe in science. They, it's all magic Jesus. It's all magical thinking. Uh, and we can't uh, discount that a significant segment of the American population is enveloped in this uh, you know, uh, very frightening conspiracy uh, theory driven, uh, you know, xenophobia, homophobia, uh, patent racism. Uh, we don't, you and I, I had to listen to Christian radio and television for the two years I did the book. Uh, those of us outside the system don't hear it. Um, but it's it's truly terrifying. And uh, this is, you know, they equate Trump with King Cyrus, who restored the Jews to Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple. Isn't that uh, a vessel, yeah, the- vessel theology, right? Uh, you, you, meant that you make the yeah, comparison that- to King Cyrus. He was revered because even though he was not, uh, you know, a, a Gentile, right. a Jew himself, he still fulfilled the will of God. Yeah, but well, that's what they'll say. But I mean, what it does is expose the the kind of personal... You know, they they put such a premium on personal piety until Trump. And I think what it does is expose them as the political movement that they are. I mean, they all began out of an attempt to fight desegregation by, you know, this is Falwell and everyone else, by setting up, quote unquote, Christian schools, which were exclusively white. That's their genesis. So, uh, yeah, that's that that is. But that's almost a 180 degree turn from where they were before because they were cloaking themselves in this kind of moral purity. And then Trump came into office, furthered their interests, and he has in in, in a number of ways, and they forgot all about it. You have to forgive me about getting excited about Cyrus. I'm actually reading Herodotus. Oh, okay. All right. And all about the Cyrus. Father, right the father of tabloid journalism. <laughs> <laughs> father of history and father of lies, right? <laughs> hey, he's entertaining. He's great. <laughs> it's interesting. It, 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 that's for sure. Uh, but anyways, that's like one of the two sources, right? The the Old Testament and, and Herodotus for, for King Cyrus uh, founded, I guess, uh, the Persian Empire. Chris, I, you're getting me right where I want to go about religion. You are a religious man. How how does religion inform your view of what's happening today? Well, I, I th- it is important to me because it is about uh, resistance as a moral imperative. Uh, it's what the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr used to call sublime madness, that it's not about the practical. Uh, and my criticism of uh, the liberal class is that when the Democratic Party under the Clintons, uh, under Bill Clinton, sold out working men and women, in particular with NAFTA, but there were all sorts of other things, destroying welfare, um, deregulating the FCC, I mean, on and on and on, Glass-Steagall, 
they didn't stand with the working class. They retreated into what I would call a kind of boutique activism of identity politics and multiculturalism, uh, all of which is important, but not divorced from economic justice. Uh, and I think when we look back, we'll realize that we should have walked out on the Democratic Party when they carried out this assault. And they carried it out uh, quite uh, consciously to attract corporate money. Uh, and of course, by the, 90, by the 90s, late 90s, the Democratic Party had fundraising parity with the Republicans. Uh, and now they kind of split. The fossil fuel industry goes with the Republicans, Wall Street goes with the Democrats, etc. Uh, and, and that gave rise to the political dysfunction, what Sheldon Wollin calls inverted totalitarianism. Uh, and uh, it, it, the rage of, in particular, white working class uh, that saw the liberal elites continue to speak in the feel your pain language of uh, of working men and women and yet consciously betray them, which is why, you know, I think they're probably more conscious of Trump than we give them credit for. Uh, but he, he is that kind of middle finger to the establishment. He attacks uh, with in vulgar and insulting ways an elite that did sell them out. And I think that um, especially given the eco side that confronts us, uh, it, it's time for us to recapture that moral imperative um, and to stand up. I mean, this is why I have not voted for a Democrat since 2000. Uh, of course, worked with Ralph Nader on his campaign, was a speechwriter. Um, and I think that, you know, we do have to stand now. I know it's late and I know and I, you know, I find the specter of another four years of Trump is disturbing as probably all of your listeners. And yet, on the other hand, can we really afford to not stand up for the values that we have? I mean, just tick off, you know, by voting for Biden, what it is you're voting for. You're voting for the humiliation of courageous women like Anita Hill. You're voting for the architects of endless war in the Middle East. You're voting for the apartheid state in Israel. You're voting for uh, the surrender of the right to privacy uh, and wholesale surveillance by the government. Uh, you're voting for austerity programs, including the destruction of welfare and cuts to Social Security, which Biden has called for repeatedly. You're voting for NAFTA, free aid trade deals, deindustrialization, a decline in wages, the loss of hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs, uh, the assault on publication, uh, public education, uh, the doubling of the prison population. Uh, as I mentioned before, you're voting against the Green New Deal and immigration reform. You're voting uh, on limiting a woman's right to abortion and reproductive rights, another feature of Biden's record. Uh, he was a uh, proponent of segregated public school system, uh, punitive levels of student debt, uh, deregulating the banking, banking industry, for-profit insurance and pharmaceutical corporations against universal health care, bloated defense budgets. That's what you're voting for. And of course, it is particularly difficult under Trump. Uh, and we should have done this a long time ago. But I think in that sense, I mean, I when I heard Obama give his speech at APAC in 2016, I spent month, seven years in the Middle East, months of my life in Gaza. I said, that's it. I cannot vote. I mean, every, the whole country can sell out the Palestinians, but I won't. In that sense, it's personal. You know, I teach in a prison and half of my students would not be there, but for Clinton and Biden. And I think we begin, we all have to pay a cost, a political cost. Uh, but I think we have to begin to stand unequivocally with the oppressed within this country. And it's late, uh, and we should have done it a long time ago. But we have to stand for something. Uh, for those of us who care about an open society, uh, who care about economic justice and racial justice uh, and uh, uh, resting back power from this oligarchic elite, Making that first step is going to be difficult, uncomfortable, uh, and if we really make it successfully, very uncomfortable because it means we'll have to go to jail. Um, but my hope, you know, what hope there is comes around these uh, kind of spontaneous uprisings uh, at Amazon and other places uh, where workers, um, because of the punishing conditions under which they now endure, are realizing um, that you know, the, 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 the corporate oligarchs are quite willing uh, to sacrifice them and their families for profit. Uh, that's a message that they've gotten.
Chris Hedges has been our guest. Again, Chris Hedges is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. He's the author of many books. His latest book is called America, the Farewell Tour. Chris, do we, do we have any books on the horizon here? I'm writing a book on me. I just was fired from Truth Dig along with the rest of the staff for going on strike uh, when the publisher tried to remove uh, the longtime editor in chief, Robert Shear. So uh, that's freed me up to focus on my book, which is on mass incarceration. I've taught in prisons for 10 years. So that's uh, actually a good hiatus. And, and I probably will start writing a column again somewhere, but I'd like to finish the book first. Chris Hedges, thank you again. Thanks, Mitch. Folks, we are heading into an extremely important time, I think, in in history, in global history, certainly in U.S. history, of what happens in the months ahead. Now, we've tried to present on this radio program, and I hope, you know, uh, not not everyone brought the same actual perspective here, uh, but we tried to bring to this radio program discussing what is happening right now in our world and what it could mean for the future. And if there, I, I, you know, I was not anticipating a moment where we just stopped everything and we're going to have to restart everything. And in that, in stopping everything, everyone has had the opportunity to examine and view the system that we live in. You know, sometimes it's a cliche to say system. I feel that when I say it myself, but for a lack of better term, we stopped everything and kind of froze everything for a moment and got to look at our world uh, without for once being, you know, in the blender as it's all, you know, moving so quick. And here we are. And as things, as we start to pick up the pieces, and of course, we'll have to see what happens in the fall. But as we start to pick up the pieces, things never snap back to the way they were before. That's just not how things work. And what happens here in our immediate future, what the next, I mean, maybe I'm overstating it, but I don't feel that way. I think what happens in the next decade, next couple of decades is going to be very much predicated and based on What's going to happen perhaps in this next year, right? What's going to happen between now and the end of the year, which includes we don't know what's going to happen in the fall with the virus and what's going to happen with a presidential election and what's going to happen uh, with uh, whether it be the same administration that had won a re-election or is it going to be a new administration? Whatever that is going to be in these times, critical time, they were critical before the virus came, but this kind of gave us a chance to stop everything for a moment. And I'm exaggerating on everything has stopped, but it's given us a moment to, to examine, look at where we are and think about where we're going to go in the future. Not just us, because I think we're always trying to do that, but everyone. And it'll probably not be some utopia afterwards. I'm pretty sure that doesn't happen. Uh, Things could get worse. It's usually a mix of things that happens, but it's going to be really determinative on on what happens now. And that's why I think this radio station is really important. Because we bring perspectives that challenge the status quo. That is for certain. And that push the envelope. And that's what we need to be thinking about right now, and that's what we need to be presenting as part of the global, national, local, and regional dialogue about the world we live in. And the only way we're able to do this, right, the only way we can challenge the common orthodoxy of the day is through listener support. Because if we were to rely on commercials, if we were to rely on corporate underwriting, you know, things are all, the, the, the way that things have been wasn't working out for everyone, but it was working out for those who were running the world, who were running the country. That, I mean, just that, you know, by default, it's working out for them because they're running things. It's the world they formed. But here is a moment that presents itself to us as a society that I don't know. Maybe there are some other potential outcomes that are 
possible right now that at least myself didn't realize were possible before. And the only way we can bring these perspectives is through the help of our listeners, and that's you. And I need your support today to keep this radio station on the air during a very critical time. So the phone number for KPFA listeners is 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. And online at kpfa.org. In Los Angeles and our Southern California listeners, the radio station you're going to support is KPFK. That phone number is 818-985-5735. 818 818- Nine eight five five seven three five online at kpfk.org. I am, as I said earlier, desperate for folks, for listeners, for friends who haven't donated before to do so now because the people that usually do donate have already done so. And we are in a situation in which there are no thank you gifts, there's no books, there's no history packs, there's no DVDs, no documentaries. We're not at capacity to be able to do those things right now because of the conditions that the world is in due to the coronavirus. But that does give us this opportunity to get back to the heart of what this relationship of public broadcasting is actually about. Asking you not to buy something, but to support something and to support this radio station and to support this radio program in this very important time. And again, the people who usually give have already given. They've already given. And if we're going to make it with this model, we need more people who usually don't give. It's not meant to shame. But people who usually don't give to give now. Because in a moment of crisis, that's when you don't want the group dynamics of one person doing the work for seven other people. <laughs> that that is that is how you go down. That is a recipe for failure, regardless of what you're doing, whether it's a class project or if it's a public radio broadcaster. When the times and and the ante is up, that is the time when everyone needs to do their part and pitch in and not rely on that one studious person who always makes sure all the work gets done because they've already done their part. For KPFA listeners. The phone number is 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. And online at kpfa.org. And in Southern California, that phone number is 818-985-5735. 818-985-5735. 5735 online at kpfk.org. We're seeing the devastating effects that this moment means too. I mean, I'm constantly reading about uh, historic clubs in the state, historic bars, historic venues that are closing down right now. I mean, this is a critical, this is a time of transfer. This is what, what, Schumpeter, we've, we've done shows about Joseph Schumpeter and this idea of creative destruction. In a way, that's what's happening here. And we're going to go through what Vijay Prashad yesterday called Corona Shock. We got to be available right now because this is that moment in time. And we as a radio station, as a community, need your support. So for KPFA listeners, that phone number again is 1-800-439-5732. one 800 439 Five seven three two online at kpfa.org. We're not here without you. I thank you. Appreciate your support. And we look forward to having another conversation with you again next week. A new proposed bylaw amendment to shorten the amendment process is available for public review at pacifica.org prior to a vote by the national and local Pacifica boards. Again, this amendment is available for review at pacifica.org.
Thank you. Thank you to all of our loyal listeners who continue to amaze us. You keep KPFA from yielding, sinking, or losing our courage to be truly independent. You bolster and sustain us. No other public radio station can truly say this and know it's true, that we are proudly listener-supported. Thanks again from all of us here at KPFA. Hi, I'm Dennis Bernstein from The Flashpoint Show. Won't you help us end our spring fun drive early so we can continue to provide you with the up-to-minute information to protect your health, wealth, and welfare? Support our efforts by donating right now at 1-800-439-5732 or at kpfa.org. Help us build up an early lead, and we promise to cut days off our fun drive. For a better KPFA to emerge after this crisis, please donate today. Thank you for listening and your generous support of 94.1 FM. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.